All right, hello everybody, and welcome on in. Excited to get started today. We're just gonna be doing a brief presentation about um, pay parity and gender diversity in tech, um, and diversity in general as well. So um, I'm gonna give another minute or two to get started, and then we'll go from there. Um, we will have time for questions at the end, but there, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to just drop them in the chat and we'll go straight from there. I'll make sure to answer every question that I get at the end. Um, and we can go ahead and get started. All right, let me get music turned down a little bit, both on the stream for everyone and also on my end. And then let me present my screen real quick. Yes, yes, I would love to. Um, last modified. This looks promising. I think that is it. Go ahead and go through it super quick. Um, make sure that's all set up, but we should be good to go. Let me scroll through these real quick. Yeah, great. Slides are great. So we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll go ahead and add to the stage real quick. Yeah. Um, so today's topic, uh, for the Talk Together speaker event is gaining pay parity and then creating and maintaining diversity in tech. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some definitions, importance of diversity, importance of pay parity, barriers like stereotypes, bias, and representation, um, creating, gaining, um, and then just general examples of some of the um, things that I've done to personally increase like gender diversity um, and other forms of diversity within the hackathon community within the broader tech community as a whole um, and how that leads to better pay parity for all. So to go ahead and get started, we'll begin with a brief introduction. So um, hi, my name is Kari. Uh, I'm an MLH coach, but also so much more. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm neurodivergent. Um, I'm a European immigrant. Uh, I moved here from Poland when I was 13. Um, I'm queer. Uh, I'm a student. I organize hackathons, mentor, lead, um, and generally consider myself um, a big techie. Uh, I've been an intern a couple times. I'm currently recruiting for full-time jobs, and that's kind of a little bit more about me from the realm and why I'm talking to you. Um, I love to knit. Um, I recently got back into the pottery studio, and I've been throwing pottery. Um, my technical interests include lots of mobile development, wearable tech, um, and the general iOS sphere, um, as well as a lot of the Apple um, ecosystem products. Um, I love to bike and cook in my free time. Uh, and as you can see, you know, there's some parts of my identity that are visible. Like you can tell that I'm blonde, that I have green eyes, or maybe that I sound American, right? Um, some of those things are in my control. Like I can dye my hair tomorrow, um, but that's, it is, it is what it is, right? Um, some parts of me are in my control. I can't control the fact that I'm an immigrant. It's just something that has happened in my life. It's a way that has defined the way that I live, right? Um, some of those provide me privileges that others do not have. Um, let's take a fun example, right? Me and my friend are traveling over one of our next breaks. Uh, we are going on a vacation together and we're super excited about it. We are going to Iceland. Um, because I am a European, um, because I still have my Polish passport, I get to go, go through security faster than she does with just her American passport, right? Because I'm a Polish citizen and I get to go through like the European line for like residency and citizens of the countries within the European Union, right? She's gonna have to go through a general line with people who don't fall under that category, right? So that's a privilege in my life that provides me some form of benefit, right? It doesn't really impact my life on a daily case. Like I don't travel internationally very often with non, you know, with friends or people with different identities, but it's something that's affecting my life right now and is providing me some form of privilege, right? Um, but it's just a fun little example that I like to give that like we don't necessarily think about. 
Um, so the first important question that you might ask is like, okay, Kari, why'd you just spend like four minutes introducing yourself? Um, and the part to that is that um, diversity can and will look different when it is done intentionally and done well. So parts of what make us diverse um, aren't always outwardly visible. Sometimes assumptions are based on how we look and act. And those assumptions are sometimes correct and sometimes match with our identities and sometimes they're not. Um, and so diversity can and will look different when it's done well, um, when it's done in a way that's intentional and that's helpful. Um, and when we see it in the various communities we interact with, but it's something that we generally have a good experience with. Um, but that's why I spend like a couple minutes making myself feel more like a person um, kind of be more like a person in, in your eyes so you can have an experience interacting with me um, and learn some things about me that you might have not known just from, you know, seeing me on the streams, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about what diversity really is and what it means to me, right? So it's variations of different characteristics in a group of people. Everything that makes us unique and things that shape our identity, whether it's race, age, gender, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, gender expression, um, anything like that, right? Or just like, you know, sometimes neurodivergence or the way we act or our nationality, all of those can be a part of our diverse background. Um, it reflects societies and demographics more accurately when we talk about diversity, right? Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, sometimes there are parts of being diverse that you can tell when you look at a person and when you interact with them. Um, sometimes there are parts that you really can't, even though you can deduce. Um, and sometimes it's something that they might not be comfortable sharing yet, or just generally might not have conversations about um, with others. Um, like it took me a very long time, even after being diagnosed um, as neurodivergent to openly talk about it, right? It took me about a year. Um, well, I guess it has been less than a year, but it took me about probably like six months to be comfortable about it. And I think like the first time I outwardly spoke about it was um, in a similar stream to this sometime around March. Um, so it allows us to speak to a more broader audience when we consider diversity in mind and when we make ourselves um, consider this at a forefront. Um, it makes us more creative and more profitable. Um, whatever that means, whether we're a large business or an individual, um, it allows us to harness, you know, what makes us unique, work effectively in teams, um, and that's really important. Um, so how do we achieve good diversity? We have diverse individuals enter tech spaces, um, if we're talking about the technology world, right? We want to make sure that events that are offered have diverse representation, um, and that's, that's key. And then we also make sure that we encourage these individuals to stay in tech spaces because one part of the battle is getting these individuals to stay in these to like enter these spaces to begin with the second part is actually making them feel welcome within those spaces um and that's really important when we think about it in the grand scheme of things um like being a part of the tech community um is like to give an example for my university right um this year uh, we had the first incoming freshman class for computer science that was majority women. Um, and that's really exciting, right? Um, it's a big stride in gender diversity. However, when we looked at the graduating statistics from the class of 2021, um, we had about 40% of women enter computer science. So obviously not 50%, but tw I think it was 30, something like some, some number in the low 30s. Um, of women that were issued a computer science diploma compared to men. So when we think about it that way, right, it's great that these women are entering these tech spaces when they come into college, right? We want to encourage, you know, young high school girls to pursue computer science as a potential degree option for them. But we also want to make sure that they have enough resources to want to stay and pursue that option if it's the right thing for them, right? We don't want to discourage people from leaving because they feel inadequate, for example. If they feel like they found their own passion, that's great. But we wanna make sure that the reason why they're leaving these spaces 
isn't because they're feeling inadequate or feeling like left behind or having any other issues within the spaces that they're a part of. That's why diversity matters to me. So let's talk a little bit about some barriers and um, stereotypes in tech that I've kind of encountered in my life. Um, The first one is that, you know, entering tech is for young people. Like we're seeing more and more college students major in computer science every single year. That's awesome. I love the fact that, you know, we've got a diverse group of young individuals entering the space, but I know from conversations that I've had with leaders, um, there's a certain stigma around being an older individual entering technology, whether you are shifting careers or whether you've been in the tech space for like, since you've graduated. Um, the pressure to leave, the pressure to constantly maintain, the pressure to like rise in ranks and become more senior um, generally amounts to uh, with age as well um the other one that i like generally seen is that it's harder or impossible for women to succeed uh women are 45 percent more likely to leave the tech industry after entering it one year after they've entered um which is kind of scary when you think about it because you know we work so hard to get to the places that we are and then we are discouraged and leave those places um the other <laughs> um stereotype that i've just like kind of encountered in my daily life is that, you know, this is a field for nerds. Um, You have to be studying constantly or, you know, always be on top of all the new technologies. You have to be working 24 seven. Um, And the reality is there's plenty of space to have fun, um, to have a great collegiate experience, have a great life outside of what makes you um, sort of, makes you enter the tech realm, if you will. Um, And then I kind of included this slightly funny one, um, can fix all of my tech problems. um, The why is my printer not working um, type of scenario, which I'm sure you've encountered, uh, whether it's from like a family friend or even a friend of a friend or one of your friends or like a parent. Who's someone like, hey, can you do this? Because you're good with tech, right? Um, And I'm like, no, I don't really work on ink cartridges that much. I don't know that much more than you. Um, so I include that one because it kind of helps to talk through like a stereotype that most of us have been affected by, um, no matter what our identity looks like, right? Um, and then there's also biases, right? Um, sometimes that are earned, sometimes that just kind of happen through different ventures, right? So the first one that I think of is past generalization, since X behaved like this, this person Y who is similar to X in some way. They look like them, they speak like them, they're from the same region, they came from the same school, they studied the same things, they got the same grades, etc. They're gonna behave the same way too. So, you know, if we had a really successful employee, that could be really beneficial. But if we have a really like unsuccessful employee, um, that is gonna kind of affect your experiences. Um, and that is a good way in which, well, not a good way, but it's a way in which we see bias um, appear within the tech realm, right? Um, And then we also have the inadequate support bias. We don't have a mentor for you with similar experience. So we can't provide you a mentor with similar experience. We can provide you a mentor with kind of sort of similar experience, or you might just have to miss out on a mentor completely because it's easier for us to match this person who has experiences in XYZ with this person who wants to go in XYZ direction, right? Um, And if you are unique in some way, whether it's your technical interests, whether it's your like identity and expression, whether it's your past experiences, it can be harder and harder to find support. Um, Like, for example, I go um, like, I go to university where a lot of the like support systems are built around web development. Um, All of the organizations that we have that do computer science projects tend to gravitate towards web development projects and web development tools. Um, I enjoy web development from time to time. It's not my main passion. It's not my main goal. It's not what I, what I, what I see myself doing for the entry point of my career. And honestly, probably for any point of my career. Um, and so it was very hard for me to find a supportive mentor who had a similar technical interest and experiences to me um, that was, you know, interested in mobile application design. And so for a time, I kind of, but that, um, 
I'd say like mission and goal of mine on the back burner as I kind of tried to fit in with the mentors that were available. Um, and you know, while I did the right things, right? Gained an internship, um, got involved in on campus communities, worked on personal projects. It didn't provide me that same level of satisfaction then finding an appropriate mentor for what I actually loved doing. And then working on projects in the space that I wanted to work on with people who had had previous relevant experience to help building different communities that allowed me to combine my skills and interests and passions. And, um, I know that that is possible for you to support. Um, but the more unique you are in this space, the harder it is to find that support. Um, so we have, um, you know, some interesting statistics that I pulled from the tech world. We have you know, 5% of the tech um, industry when it comes um, to our is women leaders. So startup founders hide women in the C-suite. Um, we have 4% of tech comprising of women of color um, compared to 16% of the U.S. population. Um, and then we have for every 100 men promoted, we have 52 women receiving a promotion, right? Um, and I kind of put these stats up here because it shows, I think, some of the challenges that come from rising through the ladder, right? So whether it's discussing, you know, um, what it's like to be a female founder um, or what it's like to be a female in a C-suite or especially what it's like to be a woman of color um, in the C-suite. Um, I think that is like really insightful information that we could all benefit from no matter what we look like. Um, and then I found um, this statistic, um, also while doing research for this presentation, um, the average salary in tech for a white man is about $90,600. The average salary in tech for a Latino man is about $73,000. The average salary in tech for a white woman is about 66.2. And the average salary in tech for a black and Latino woman is about 57,000, right? So we're seeing disparities at every level. Um, but when especially we compare the salary of a white man to the salary of a black and Latino woman, that's where we're really seeing the biggest divide, right? Um, and average salaries take into account a lot of things. Um, they take into account, you know, um, right, like they just take into account lots of things. Um, and so it is more complicated to try and fix this divide. Um, part of it is, you know, encouraging women to take jobs that are to like believe that they can take more competitive jobs. And I shot myself in the foot with this a few times where I took the first offer that came because I didn't think I was capable of receiving anything better. And in reality, I was capable of receiving something better and I was capable of pushing myself and I was capable of more than I expected myself to. But with the way that I am with the identities that affect me, um, that's something that I had to deal with. That was especially difficult. Um, yeah, so what does that mean, right? It means that these numbers come through in a lot of different like sections, right? The first one is finding actual employment, right? Like I mentioned, um, sometimes people tend to underestimate their abilities, like right? not apply for offerings that they meet qualifications for, um, aiming lower than what they can actually achieve, um, going for jobs that don't necessarily align with skill sets or their expertise or their experiences because they don't have say the backing of a family member in case something goes wrong um they need to be employed at all times in order to survive um and that also comes with the maintaining employment right um if you are coming in from um, a situation that is you know have more financial burdens and struggles um if you lose your job or quit your job in order to start a new venture. If you come from a household with high income, with a family structure that can support you through those three months or through those six months or through that one year in which you pursue your passion project, they dislike with less growth, less you have to dedicate to their primary job going significantly slower. And so they're making less benefit from it financially. Because in the moment, they need to have that financial security, that financial blanket, because no one else is going to provide it, right? And it also comes to climbing the corporate ladder. 
Um, you know, if we talk about um, something that has been going around a lot in fitness spaces, right, recently, is we all have the same 24 hours in a day where you can pick how you spend your 24 hours. Okay. I suppose that's to an extent true, but my 24 hours as a college student, right, who has um, a lot of different luxuries right now from being in college, I live in a dorm, so my commute is super short to get from places to place, from place to place. Um, I have access to a vehicle, um, thanks to my lovely roommate. Um, so if I need to run an errand, it's relatively easy to do, right? I have access to family um, in the form of some like support, guidance, whatever I might need, right? Um, I have access to friends, I have access to healthcare, I have access to lots of different things that I need, right? But comparing that, let's say, with even another 21 year old, right? Who is in community college, who has a child to take care of, um, and who lives at home taking care of an elderly parent. We might have the same 24 hours in a day, but I can't, I don't have two people to take care of. I, my main priority right now is taking care of myself. And that's awesome, right? It's great to be able to take care of yourself, but I don't have the same 24 hours that that other person does, is the like, person that we're talking about, right? Because they're spending part of their 24 hours making sure their parent has all of their medication, their appointments are in place, they're well fed, taken care of, and generally like, maintain their life. They also maintain the life of a child, right? Make sure they go to school, get all of their checkups done, go to after school activities. Um, and then, you know, we talk, it, it comes up a lot in fitness spaces, right? Because everyone has time to go to the gym. I might have time to go to the gym. I went kayaking today and it was awesome. It took three hours out of my day, right? But if I had to do something this morning, like run to go get groceries, drive someone to an appointment, um, take care of things, or even work part-time, right? I wouldn't have been able to do that. And so how does that connect to climbing the corporate ladder? If you are the head of household, right? Um, sometimes you might need to step away from your corporate responsibilities to deal with life responsibilities, um, no matter what those may look like for you, right? Um, especially true if you stay single parent, right? Um, who might not always have someone to call in case of an emergency. Um, and you are the emergency contact, right? So that is kind of where that difficulty comes in. Um, and we know that women and women of color are disproportionately single parents. So that's a good, I think, example that summarizes it, um, like why these disparities really exist. Um, but let's talk about, you know, what we can do, what I, you know, as a college student can do, and was you as a viewer of the stream, um, as a hackathon attendee, um, as a Tech Together attendee this weekend, what you can do, right? Um, the first one that I really like to talk about is the power of advocacy and mentorship. Um, you are never too young to be a mentor. There's always someone in need of your guidance. What does that mean? Um, there is always someone who requires some form of support that has been in your shoes in some way. You're at this hackathon, right? This might be your first hackathon. It may be your fifth hackathon. It may be your 500th hackathon, right? But now, I could be a mentor and a support system to all of the people that have never been to a hackathon before. And if they have questions about, hey, what is it like to attend a Tech Together event? What is it, is it like to attend a digital hackathon? Like, I'm really confused. I feel out of it. I don't feel like I belong. You can provide all of them that form of guidance. Um, and that's really powerful. Um, what else can you do? Um, you can you know, advocate for more events like these to exist Yeah, in your spaces, right? We have Tech Together events that exist in the MLH spaces, but we also have Tech Together events that um, are partnered by, with MLH that exist physically in various cities around the US, right? I went to Tech Together Miami in May. 
uh, for example. So you can advocate for a Tech Together chapter in your area and for a Tech Together hackathon to take place that you can help organize. Um, and that's incredibly powerful because it allows us to bring the power of hackathons and the power of organizing and the power of diversity and inclusion to all those events. Um, and that's incredibly powerful. So yeah, let's talk about resource outreach. Um, one of the things that you can do um, is just be a trove of knowledge and a trove of information. Um, gather information and support for others. Provide safe spaces for communities that you're a part of. Create forms of meaningful change. It might feel small to you, but it won't necessarily feel small for someone else. And then finally, continue efforts that you've already begun through to the completion. I think this one's really important because we see a lot of good ideas that don't execute all the time. And so when we have a good idea and we see success with it, or even when it's still getting started, following through with it is one of the best things we can do to improve resource outreach. Um, whether, you know, we build a dashboard of all diversity, equity, and inclusion hackathons in the world, or we provide um, a women in computing chapter. Um, I can talk more about that. Or a National Society of Black Engineers chapter or a Hispanic Sc uh, Scholar Foundation chapter. Whatever that looks like to us, uh, providing those spaces can be very, very beneficial. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about gaining pay parity and what this means to me, right? First of all, we have to realize that this is a worldwide effort, right? I am coming into this with an America centric lens. What does that mean? I, for most of my life, or for at least parts of, of my like adolescent life, I lived in America. I go to an American university. I have worked American jobs, right? And I see myself living here for some period of time. Um, that doesn't mean that this is a situation that's only applicable to people in America. Um, diverse talent exists everywhere. Um, it's important to make sure that we are giving equal opportunities to lots of different people. Um, it's really important. I do a lot of work with international students um, and the visa hunting process, um, job hunting process with international students um, is particularly challenging due to the visa constraints, right? Um, but in the interest of fairness, in the interest of equity, in the interest of honestly diversity and having different thoughts, bringing these efforts outside of your own bubble, coming to events like these that are worldwide, having a chance to interact with others in a meaningful way, um, it's really important. Um, and bringing these efforts outside of your own bubble can really have an impact on the number of people you are able to like sort of have, can have an impact on the amount of people you can have an impact on, which is a bad way to word things, but it is really what it is. It can have a really positive effect on the amount of people you, whose lives you change. And it might sound cheesy to be like, oh my gosh, the amount of people whose lives I've changed. But it is that. So, now, um, I'm presuming most of you as Major League Hacking attendees, um, you know, and Hack Together attendees, you have been a student at some form of your life. You're a student now, will be a student soon, you just finished being a student. Um, so what can you do if you're in that space? You can promote DEI efforts to other organizations and of other organizations. So if you have a variety of different resources and tools for improving diversity, equity, and inclusion that are run by different spaces on your campus or outside of your campus, it's important to promote them. For example, me being here, right? We're promoting Tech Together and the idea behind it, promoting the DEI of Tech Together, of MLH and what it looks like for us, right? We keep track of current issues, efforts, and trends. We realize what are the most common problems that other students are facing, younger students are facing. It's really important for us to have an idea of the things that are happening. Uh, we also provide support as mentors and engage in programs as mentees. What does that mean? Mentors love mentees. We, as someone that has mentored extensively, 
we only mentor because there are people there that want our guidance. If people don't engage in the programs we provide, we won't continue providing them. And that's incredibly important. Um, whenever we're ready and feel like we could provide mentorship, it's great to be able to do so. So I think that's another great resource that we can do, um, that we can take advantage of. Honestly, this one's kind of cheesy, but it works out quite well. It's just to dream big. And honestly, sorry, I've got a phone call. Um, what should I be taking care of now? Um, it's honestly just a dream big, right? This might sound super cheesy. It is kind of cheesy, but in reality, a lot of us tend to shoot, or, shoot ourselves in the foot and tend to undervalue the things that we can accomplish. And so believing in ourselves can sometimes be the best thing to do for ourselves. Um, the other thing that I see is making sure to make all spaces inclusive. So events like Tech Together are fantastic. They allow for marginalized communities, women tech, to take advantage, right? But the goal is not for these spaces to be the only spaces in which we can feel safe. And the only spaces in which we feel great. Um, and in which we have access to these opportunities. The goal is for all spaces to feel like that. And that begins with efforts at those spaces too. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, even if you know you, you start something, following through with it can be one of the most powerful things that you can accomplish. So that's great. And then, yeah. Are you looking for a job? I'm looking for a job. Let's talk about what job seekers can do to improve their pay parity, right? Um, you can research fair pay in your region based on title, education, and experience. Doing your research can go a long way. Um, it can find, it can help you find out whether you are being valued at the amount that other people are being valued. If you have a title, you have education, you have experience. Everyone has title and education and experience. Um, and so that's really, really the best thing you can do for yourself. Lots of us are more open in having these conversations online. So it can be great to do that research there. But also don't be afraid of doing that research with your peers. Yeah, make sure your resume makes you shine. It's not the time to be shy. I learned this one the hard way. I've always struggled with not necessarily selling myself, because that's a bad way to put it, but with like putting my best foot forward out of fear of sounding conceited or ego, like egotistical or something. I don't know. Um, this is not the time to be shy. It's not the time to be afraid of that. Make sure your resume is great. Ask for feedback. Continue to ask for feedback as you progress through your life um, and you'll have a great experience. Have open dialogues about the job search process with friends and mentors. This one's incredibly important. This is one that I've had, like, that I've personally seen a lot of benefit out of. I got lunch with a friend yesterday. We're both in the middle of the job hunt right now. It's a fun time. We were, I think we had kind of realized we were, were having similar experiences, but not necessarily that much. Um, and sitting down together and, you know, mostly catching up as friends, but also just like having an open dialogue about this made us both feel a lot more at ease about what we can accomplish in the future and what our life could look like. Um, and also like what other people are going through. Um, you've got dream big again, keep in it. I think it's great. Um, continue to dream big for your careers. I, like I mentioned, um, I had an internship experience this summer that if you would have told me, like, honestly, any second before I got it, that that's where I would be at, I, I would have not believed you. Um, and it was a series of my skills and my talents and my interests, but also just a ton of amazing people that made that happen, including myself, um, that it, like, it gave me a lot of power to believe that I was capable. Um, and that power continues to affect the way that I, you know, that my life works out now. 
And then practice. Practice talking about your skills, accomplishments, and negotiation. So what does that mean? It means continue to take advantage of lots of resources. There are usually fantastic career centers on college campuses, great mentors they can have challenge like conversations with. Uh, when I was feeling really nervous for technical interviews, me and one of my friends did a mock technical. She asked me a question, I asked her a question. We sat on my like on my kitchen table for like two hours and we just went through some questions together. And it made me feel so much better because she was able to provide constructive feedback. But she was also a person I wasn't afraid of. She wasn't an interviewer. She wasn't going to judge me if it went poorly. She was going to provide me constructive feedback on how I wrote things and help me improve for better moving forward. And then advocate for yourself during job interview negotiations. You should always talk about your skills, your experience, the relevant things you've done. You're a great fit for the company if you're having negotiations. They already know that. So make sure you are your number one fan. I think that's really important. And I just dropped my light. That's besides the point. All right. Let's go into more stories and more things that I've done in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, yeah. We'll start off with Grace Hopper 2023, um, which I can talk a lot more about now. But uh, when I was, when I first gave a version of this talk in, I think it was March or April. Um, I had just started the recruiting process for uh, being a Grace Hopper coordinator at my university. Um, and that meant gathering scholarship support, organizing groups, and ensuring equitable access to resources, right? So um, I went through a lot of different iterations of my university of things that we could have done. Um, I like applied for funding um, and received fun enough funding to have the opportunity to have girls in the community travel um, as well as attend various, um, like the Grace Hopper celebration, both in person and virtually. We worked with the university extensively to make sure that the tickets were bought. And then we worked with our funds to make sure that all of the additional expenses were covered. Um, we did a lot of organizing groups. We conducted all of the interviews in which we considered a variety of different factors. We made sure that we were sending a diverse group of individuals that had different interests for going to the conference. Some of them are more interested in data science and data analytics. Some of them are more interested in cybersecurity. One of them is interested in pursuing graduate school and for their educational studies. Um, one of them is more interested in just a variety of different um, fields. One of the girls that, I, that is um, attending it has a really strong interest in autonomous vehicle um, and it has done extensive research into that field and is looking for connections within that space. One of them is more interested in electrical engineering. We want to make sure that we had a group of individuals that was well-rounded that represented our university. Well, um, I was like, yes, these are the people that I want um, for this conference to see. I'm like, oh, yes, they attended this university. That's awesome. Um, and it helps for ensuring equitable access to resources, right? We considered the financial barriers to attending the conference when we had those conversations. Um, and that's incredibly important, right? Grace Hopper, for those of you who don't know, is incredibly expensive. Um, and so talking and having those conversations about finance, financial means is really important. Um, and yeah. The other um, example that I want to give is the Vienna Hacks Mentorship Program. Uh, which I was in um, last spring. Um, as we now prepare for a hackathon, we are in a little bit more of the planning mode for that, but we run a mentorship program every spring. I've been a part of it for three years now, two years um, as a mentor and one year as a mentee. Um, it allows us to expand the role of hackathon organizers into leaders of the community. Um, and that's really important to us because we want the hackathon to feel like not just a hackathon, right? not just a 36 hour event. Um, our student organization has a presence on campus throughout the entire school year. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are a resource for this, for the organization to use. Um, it allows us for, for improvements in the form of providing technical involvement outside of the event, right? It allows for different individuals in the community to take advantage of the resources that we have, whether it's you know expertise from someone that likes learning various things or just 
whatever specific resources we can provide, it's incredibly helpful to actually have those benefits. Um, and the mentorship program was a huge success when it finished off last spring. And I'm excited to see what it looks like moving forward um, because I think it has a really great space within the community. Um, and we can really do lots of fantastic things um, providing these mentorship spaces on a collegiate campus. Yeah. All right. Thanks, y'all. That is the end of this presentation. It's been about 42 minutes. Um, but thank you all so much for joining me uh, during this conversation. I had a great experience. Um, you're more than welcome to ask me any questions in the chat. I'm going to stay on for probably another couple of minutes, uh, wait for more questions to come in. Uh, but if you don't have anything, um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, a wonderful rest of your tech together. And I look forward to, you know, seeing what amazing projects you accomplish this weekend. All right. Thank you, everyone. And swap it out to thank you for joining. And we're going to give it a couple more minutes for any questions. But I think that was great. All right. Thank you all very much for coming. This is always one of my favorite streams um, and like not even streams, but like conversations that I have. Um, I'm really passionate about um, these benefits and having these conversations. I think they're really important. So. All right, y'all, I am going to hop off since I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Let you get all get back to hacking, but I am wishing you a wonderful rest of your hackathon. Really excited to check in on the Tech Together projects once you're all done. And I look forward to seeing what amazing things you can build. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>